Uh, let me just first say that uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, many of you heard me talk way too much during the road show, but I'm incredibly grateful uh, to Dale Lynch and Barry Olhausen, who are here today, who sponsored those events, uh, talking about licensure, talking about human capital. And today, this is one topic that we're really excited about, what could happen in the future of teacher preparation and quality in Tennessee. And it's more important that you don't listen to someone like me. We actually hear directly from districts that are doing this work. I'd also say, just a really exciting and busy time. Uh, today, I know the TOS board and the superintendent's executive committee heard about the new strategic plan, which will be sent to all superintendents today, as well as be announced publicly tomorrow at the lead conference. Um, and so, we just have a lot going on. Um, I'll be presenting tomorrow at LEAD as well as TASP on Thursday, and that is why I'm looking forward to resting my voice today. But we're really excited to have you all here. I also just want to point out one thing when we talk about last week at the Roadshow about listening to districts. Thank you so much for coming here today. I know it's difficult for parking, and because of the Roadshow last week, one thing that the Human Capital team is committed to moving forward, all future TDOE events from Human Capital will always be at districts moving forward. That way, not only are we constantly reminded about the students in our schools, but there'll be better parking, easier to access. So I just want to point that out. I, I really appreciate you all coming out here today. And another rationale for the scheduling of today was that with the lead conference tomorrow, we knew some folks would be here in Nashville. Typically, we want to make sure more of our events are out in the field where our districts are doing the work. So with that said, thank you very, very much for coming here today. And I'd actually like to uh, kick it off by uh, sending this over to Sean and Pertris, the Chief Academic Officer for Clarksville Montgomery, and uh, Mason Bellamy, so thank you. Okay, welcome. Um, how many of you are at the TOS conference? Okay, so we're gonna do a short overview of the TOS conference because this, this meeting was requested based on feedback from the TOS conference. So I'm not gonna go into great detail on these slides, but I do wanna introduce them. So in our district, um, this, is a, this is a partnership between Austin P and Clarksville Montgomery County School System, also National Teacher Residents. You'll hear about Lipscomb. You'll hear about um, Clarksville Montgomery County Education Association. So we wanted to develop multiple pathways to increase, increase diversity through successful residency experiences. And we did that based on some strategic work. I do want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Phyllis Casebolt, who was the Director of Educator Quality, uh, Janine Johnson, who um, was the Director of Human Resources, and Melissa Isaac, who is now the Director of Educator Quality, because this research came from a planning grant that they applied for. So what we know is when you look at a snapshot of our district, we have 40 schools, 36,500 students and growing. We have a 30-year average of growing 600 students a year. The last four years, Three of those four years, we've grown by 1,200 students. 40% of our schools were achieving reward status, which we we're very proud of in, in a district that has that kind of growth and mobility. But as we entered this strategic work, we were purely looking at how we increase diversity of our teaching task force. But what happened was, as we we're in the middle of this work, the teacher shortage hit us. We're one of the five biggest districts in the state, and I think if you're in that area, you're probably experiencing some of that right now. So we have 2,100 teachers. 16% of them are ethnically diverse. Um, and we were 30 teachers short in 2018-19. Um, 16 teachers short this year, but that's only because we did some initial pipeline work. We would have been 80 teachers short this year. If you look at those big districts, you can compound that shortage every year. We could predict to be 160 teachers short the following year. So even though the research was pure around increasing diversity, it also made us kick it into gear because now we're facing a situation where we have very high achieving schools and growth oriented schools, but we don't have qualified teachers in classrooms. We cannot sustain and expand that growth in that kind of situation. So this is what the, the dichotomy is, the discrepancy is between our teachers and our students. This is why the research was so important that the human res resource department started. We're 16% ethnically diverse, 
and our students are 50%. It goes without saying that students benefit from being taught by teachers that look like them. They see pathways to success, higher graduation rates, opportunities for growth and development. And so we, that's how we started this research. Really wanted to increase that. But then the national trend of people entering the teaching profession kind of hit us uh, like, a, like a ton of bricks a couple of years ago. So in 1975, 22% of freshman college students declared themselves as education majors. That was the number one major in the United States. You go 40 years later to 2015, 10% of freshmen declare themselves as education majors. To two years later, we're down to 4.6%. <coughs> so the people going into the profession are dramatically decreased as far as the percentages going into education. And, and the state numbers <coughs> mirror that. If you look in 2014-15, there were 7,825 enrolled in teacher ed prep programs. Within a year, that went down by 1,500 students. That led us to our pipeline work. So two years ago, we started the research three years ago. One of the pieces of research was uh, to look at national <coughs> teacher residency. Dr. Ra Randall Lahan is here. And Dr. Randall Lahan and Clarksville Montgomery County came together to partner to get an early start with residency. I, I appreciate Dr. Lahan. Um, the National Teacher Residency taught us a lot. It taught us about the fidelity of residency programs and how important it is that these residents have a master teacher to learn from, that there's three periods of co-teaching, there's co-planning, that you treat them like a teacher, there's a gradual release, they're not out there doing lunch duty, covering buses, covering substitutes that didn't show up. And so we saw initial results there. 50% of our, our 12 candidates that finished were ethnically diverse, which matched our student population. They're now first year teachers, but they're not first year teachers. They're, they're far from it. They're experienced teachers that are getting great results in the classroom. Again, having that approach, the medical approach of learning under a master for a whole year in a classroom uh, while you're getting paid, um, and we're funding your education to a large degree, um, is a great model. We take it from the research, uh, uh, the medical research, and we have seen early results from that. Our second pipelines were, <coughs> so one of the areas that we researched was Fresno State and Fresno Unified. Um, so they had a $23 million grant to do teacher pipelines. I knew something about Fresno, I graduated from Fresno State. And what happened there is they had like 12 different pipelines, but you can narrow them down to two categories. They had pipelines for degree personnel, like classified people, and they had non-degree, which could be your students or some more of your classified. So we were committed, since we had one degree pipeline for middle and high school, to get an early learning teacher residency um, for our non-degree personnel. And so that's 20 high school seniors and, and 20 classified. And I'm going to bring up um, Dr. Prentice Chandler from Austin Peay, the dean for the, school, um, the Austin Peay State University, and Dr. Barron to talk about that. Good afternoon. Um, so I want to start off by saying I've been in higher education and teacher education for about 14 years. Uh, and this is the first time that the state and the district and the College of Ed and the teachers union have worked together on a project, which seems odd to me. Uh, it seems that we're all sort of going toward the same goal, but we go at it sort of in isolation. Um, so that's the first thing that's a part of this project. The audience for this, obviously, is school districts, right? That's the people in the room. We're going to have a follow-up meeting in December where we're going to invite colleges of education to hear this talk and think about how they might go about this work. Uh, Dr. Baird and Dr. Brewster uh, and I are the representatives from Austin P. And so our part of this presentation is pretty, pretty small, uh, but I would like to, for, the, for the district leaders to think about how it is that you think about partnerships. Uh, I, I, I would probably have a hard time finding someone in this room if I were to say, do you do partnerships with, local, uh, with your local, local university? Most of you would say that you do, right? 
And so one of the ships that we've made in the College of Education at Austin P is thinking, we sometimes call it the little P and the big P, little P partnership, big P partnership. Little P partnership is what most folks do most of the time in colleges of education. It's traditional, it's historical, uh, you tend to do it with the people that are right around your university. And a lot of times it involves, that, you know, I know who you are, you know who I am, you can pick up the phone and call us when you need a sped teacher or a math teacher, and we get along and we meet once or twice a year. Little P partnership. Big P partnership is something that we do and we are doing with this project. And before I get too much further along, uh, when we meet with the EPPs in here in about a month, one of the things I'm going to say to them is that none of this would have been possible without our president and provost signing off on it. So if you try to do something, this, uh, something like this with a university, oftentimes it's above the dean's pay scale. I'm saying. So if a lot of this gets approved, a lot of times it's the president of the university. Um, Big P partnership is something completely different. You need, that, you need those relationships, you need those uh, little P <coughs> components. But the big P, I like to conceptualize it as thinking about getting at persistent issues, persistent problems in education. Uh, universities that have teacher education and school districts are notorious for complaining about the same problem for decades at a time. And we sort of tweak and we, and we we hit around the margins and we try to fix it, but we never, I say we collectively, colleges of ed are to blame to, to really getting at the heart of the structure of the problem. Uh, this, this project that we have going on does that. And so we are getting at teacher diversity, which I would guess is in most of your strategic plans. Uh, workforce sort of pipeline, do you have enough teachers issue, right? And then the other one that seems to always be a persistent problem is getting enough folks in high needs areas. And so what we've done with this project is gotten at all three of those structural persistent problems in education. And I hope you can see the distinction between little p and big p. Right? It's not like one is good and one is bad, but one gets at the margins and one gets at sort of the heart of problems. It's a sort of solution uh, approach, uh, oriented orientation. So this project, uh, as, as Dr. Imperatrice has already mentioned, we found a way to send 40 people to school for free. Uh, 20 are EAs that were already working in the school district, and 20 are traditional age students. Uh, because we want to get these people into the field as soon as possible, we took at the university, we took our four-year plan and made it into a three-year plan. It's not less coursework, it's just accelerated through the summer and some other sort of uh, adjustments. Um, we also found a way, thanks to Dr. Brewster, raise your hand, Dr. Brewster, um, to do a dual license. So the school district said they needed early, early learning, but they also needed people who had an endorsement in special education. So we, we made that happen. Uh, I mentioned before that this is tuition free. Uh, they'll have a worksheet on that later, but the other half of the tuition was covered by the university. That's where when you talk to deans in your neighborhood, that's gonna be something they'll need to talk with with their president. I'd be happy to explain how we did it offline if somebody wants to have that conversation with me afterwards. Um, I don't want to have it in front of everybody, but uh, you can talk to me about how much it costs and how we did that too. Uh, all of these people will be employed by the school district during their three years in our program. So instead of coming out traditional where you have one semester of student teaching and then you go into the workforce, these people will be receiving their education and be working in the schools for three years. So it, in effect, becomes a three-year residency model. Uh, we're gonna probably talk about the research on this later, but the research when it comes to attrition with compared to people who went through traditional student teaching versus residency, you probably can guess, resident, residency people tend to stay in the field a lot, uh, a, a lot uh, higher rate than people that just went through the traditional uh, student teaching. And then the last piece I'll say, and if you don't remember anything else I say, because we've got a couple of hours to talk about this, um, if your district decides to do this, please ensure that you have thought through the academic supports for the people uh, who are in your residency program. Because what we have is we have a lot of first generation, a lot of underrepresented people who are in the residency program. It's already accelerated. It's the first time they've been in college. It's the first time they've taken math in like 20 years, <laughs> some of them. And so it, it, you really do a whole disservice to the project if you're not willing to think about how to support these students <coughs> academically from the district. The university has supports, but the, the district needs to think of, really think that piece of this through. Because we've given this talk a couple of times and I get, two, I get two facial responses, facial reaction. I get people who smile at me who think it's the best idea ever. And I get people who look at me like they can't believe what I'm saying. 
for those people who are smiling who think this is a really good idea, I'm glad you think it's a good idea, let's think about the, the academic support that these people are going to need. Otherwise, the attrition is going to be really high, and you're going to have wasted, probably, probably wasted resources. So uh, to talk a little bit about, we've, we've already spoken about where we are today. So we have 10 to 15 NTR folks coming out of these pathways each year that's helping us fill that void. It's how we went from 30 open positions last year to only 16 this year um, using those programs, even though the shortage has, has worsened. Um, our APSU partnership is going to produce 40, uh, 40 licensed, dual licensed teachers, but that's going to happen every three years because it's a three-year residency, right? So right now we're not feeling the help from those 40. But that's still two years off in the distance for that graduation date. Um, and then that, that costs us to do this about a million dollars out of our GP fund. And so that's, that's something that Montgomery County and, and our director of schools walked in a little bit ago, Mr. House, um, our senior leadership team decided that was an investment worth making. And so this, this program's about a million dollars it's currently costing us. What we're going to in the future and what we're here to announce today, and I'm going to kick it up back to, to David here in just a second to talk a little bit about how we expand this work without expanding the budgetary requirement of this work. And that's what's really excited or exciting. So we'll continue on with our pathways with our NTR residents. That's been a promising avenue. We'll continue that partnership. We look to add an APSU pipeline every year now. So that two years from now when that first cohort's graduating, every year after that, 40 more people are graduating. And those 40 people are entering our workforce every year. Um, and then we've got Lipscomb in the, in the room with us. Dr. Vanessa Garcia and Dr. Deborah Boyd are with us from Lipscomb University, announcing a partnership with us today that we're particularly proud of as well. And that will be for degree residents. They'll go through a shorter residency and come out with a master's degree at no cost to themselves, dual certified as well, and be ready to step in right into our classrooms as well. Um, and I, I know that's, I, I became certified through a similar program and I definitely did not get that paid for um, by, by my district. And so I, I may look at going back and adding a second master's degree at this point as well. But that's going to represent approximately three to three and a half million dollars invested into this program with minimal GP impact. The first million we've already got earmarked. We, we had to make a three year commitment for that. The additional two, two and a half is what we're here to announce today and explain how we're going to get after that money without it impacting our GP budget. There'll be some kick-in from title funds. There'll be some, some kick-in in a couple places, but it really will be a very minimal impact to the GP budget when you're planning for these residencies. And so that leads us to our, our new graphic. You've seen the one we're currently working with, and this new graphic now represents twice the amount of, or of degree pathways. We've added in our LTR with our partnership with Lipscomb. And we've doubled the amount, which will, over time we'll add a third cohort as, over here as well, um, so that every year we've got 40 students graduating with our partnership with Austin P. So we have our early learning teacher residency currently ongoing, and then we're going to have an elementary middle teacher residency. And again, both of these programs are going to have dual certified people coming out, and currently um, what, what we are showing is that our diversity rates are significantly higher than our current workforce, between 40 and 50 percent, where our workforce is currently 16. So we're getting at that problem as well. And so that represents our significant investment into the future going forward. And I'm going to turn it over to David uh, for a second and let him talk a little bit about how we're going to do that. And then we'll jump into the fiscal modeling that I know you see in, in your handout in front of you there. Thank you. Yes, sir. So one thing about being new to Tennessee and about being new to this role is that I know the best ideas come from those already working here. I come here with over a decade of district experience and I know districts innovate better than the state ever could. And so that's why when I came here and Sean pulled me aside and he said, you know, David, there's a way to do grow your own with existing funds that already, uh, that already are available with that minimal impact to the general fund. I was like, well, tell me more, how do I do this? And so they pulled me aside and they showed me what needed to be done. And so with that, we found out that by leveraging the commissioner's waiver authority on class size averages, there would be a way to make this work become more sustainable. And so with that, I'm grateful that uh, when I had the opportunity to share this with <coughs> Commissioner Schwinn, she said, that just makes sense. I don't understand why we weren't already doing this. And so we were able to approve, when you think about how did Clarksville be able to reinvest $2 million into this work, it's solely through 
uh, class size waiver uh, flexibility. The other thing we heard from Gatlinburg was what you all just saw was pretty much a, a very expedited recap, and I appreciate the brevity. <laughs> but the thing that we need to talk about now is, okay, so I, you're giving us options, potentially, of class size waiver flexibility. Now, how do we make this work? We need more time focusing on that fiscal modeling. And so the rest of this session turns into that. What are the actual getting into the weeds, the nitty gritty of how do I make this work for my district, as well as what are the things that I need to be thinking about in addition as I consider launching this new initiative in my district. And that is where I'll be turning back over, but also please know that myself and Josh Mason from the state perspective are here to provide technical assistance moving forward, because uh, we're really, really excited about where this could go and what this could mean uh, for a new generation of future teachers. Thank you, guys. Thanks, David. Um, let me put you at ease a little bit first, though. When you start talking class size waivers, and most people go immediately to, you're, you're picturing more students in a teacher's classroom, which is not always going to be a positive, a well-received thing, right? Um, so a lot of this started in, Dr. Imperatrice and I were working on two separate projects. I was working on something about staffing my hardest to staff schools, my neediest schools, my most at-risk schools. At, at the time, I was the elementary director. And I was looking at a model called the Opportunity Culture, research based out of public impact, if you're familiar with their work. If you're not, familiarize yourself with it. It's impressive stuff. Um, and, and I was in Sean's office one day at about 5 o'clock after most everybody had left, and we were both kicking around our problems, and he was working on residencies. And that, this is where the two things collided. And so public impact research shows with the Opportunity Culture model that you can increase class sizes slightly and also increase student achievement through using existing support structures appropriately. And that's what we've got to get to as we work through the rest of the day is how we're going to save the money to pay for this and how we're going to support teachers better than we currently do even with a few more kids in their classroom. And ultimately how are we going to get after student achievement and how are we going to make sure that that's not taking a dip because we're producing <laughs> teachers down the line and fixing a different problem. And so let's jump right into the numbers. And so these are the, these are the handouts you have in front of you. If you see on the left-hand side that first all teachers column, that column represents what the average teacher in our district, we work through our financial office, that's what the average teacher in our district cost us, this $75,000 number down here at the bottom. Now you'll notice as we get through the scenarios, you don't see $75,000 show up as savings anywhere there. We use this middle number, $67,000, because we're not replacing the average teacher, we're replacing the, the empty hole we have in our classroom, the, the spot we couldn't fill, right? And that's going to be somebody who's usually significantly lower on our teaching grid. Um, and so that's going to be a little bit less of a cost savings than taking your average teacher. So we're using a $67,000 number. Now you guys know this is a moving target. If you have someone that doesn't take your insurance, you save less because their insurance is not coming out of that. Right, you're going to save 10000 less. But you have to get a model to start with. So we assume the average teacher is taking our insurance and this is what we can save when we, when we uh, cut that position, or save that position rather. Our teacher residents, the ELTRs are right here in the last column. And this is a little bit even more of a moving target because we have 20 high school seniors coming in at the very first step on our grid. They're going to cost us less. And then we've got 20 existing employees that if, if they've been with us, one lady in this program has been with us for over 20 years and is going back to school. And so she's significantly higher on our classified pay grid than a new, t than a, a, a new employee coming right out. So this is what the average ELTR is costing us right now. And again, we, we just had to get a, a number that we could start with. So it's going to cost us about $26,000 a year to give them a, a, that, that working salary while they're earning their degree. So those are the numbers we started with. And then we jump right into looking at some different schools. And this is where you can really get off into the staffing weeds. And when you start looking at where you want to put this in your school district, you need to bring in that person who's, who's directly responsible for overseeing those schools. Because it can look good on paper. And in actuality, when you put it in the building because of other things going on, it doesn't always look as good as it does on paper. So you need someone who's familiar with that. You need principals on board too, because they're the ones who are going to live with, with what we're doing as far as incre increasing class sizes and increasing their staffing ratios. So there's a few little things I want to call your attention to as we go through the five elementary schools. And you can see different variations of things playing out as we do this. Our first elementary school is a K through two elementary school. That's why there's not a four or five column. So we're only working on that K through three ratio. And you can see we can go above the average, but we still cannot exceed the max of 25. The max cannot be exceeded in this waiver, but the average can be. 
So you can see at this particular school, we were able to save one position in K1 and 2. This school was already staffed fairly aggressively under BEP to begin with, and we're able to, to save a position in each one of those. I mean, you can see what that does to our adult, our class size ratios. Originally, it was right at 18 is where this school sat. By losing a position in each grade level, it sits now at almost 21, still barely above the uh, what we need to waiver for, honestly. But you see that second number out there, that 15.8? That's the adult to student ratio happening in these classrooms. For every one of those teachers that we took out of the mix, we added two early learning teacher residents to the mix, or two residents of some type, right? So now you've got one less teacher, but two extra adults that are working hands-on capacity with students, right? So now we're supporting teachers a little bit differently. And I'm really excited later on to talk to you about our support models. That's not the, the point of the presentation I'm at right now, but when we get to how we can support these teachers, how we support these students, and how we create residents that are, are better trained than typical graduates, um, I'm excited to talk to you more about that. So I'm gonna continue on through our, our financial modeling right now, and without, again, getting too deep into the weeds, just give you a high-level overview of a couple different scenarios of how this plays out in schools. So you can see elementary two is a three through five school. It's an odd situation in our district where we have K through two students funneling here, and then they go to a different elementary school for three through five. It's the only situation we have like that. You can see at this particular school, we're able to save a teacher in third grade. In fourth grade, you can see we're not able to do that. And you notice that 121 there. That's close enough. If we, if we knock that number down to four, four teachers, you've got almost 30 kids a classroom at that point. You're getting dangerously close to that max size that we cannot violate. So if, if enough students move in during the year, we're going to have to place a teacher there anyways to not violate that. But you're also getting to a place where we just feel like that's, that, that's a little over where we want to be to be responsible and support the teacher. Because at the end of the day, we don't want to create a different problem by solving the teacher shortage problem and the residency problem. So that's one where, as the elementary level director, I said I would not try to save that position there. It doesn't seem responsible to me to, to, to do that in that particular place. In fifth grade, you can see we can absolutely do it. They're at 101 students currently. Now this is all based off spring projections, right? So how many kids actually show up in August versus what we plan for? You may have to be flexible. If, those, if, if kids move, which we're a mobile district, we have military PCSing in and out all the time, we've got to save ourselves some flexibility and know that just because we put it on paper in May doesn't mean that that's what actually needs to happen in August. We may have to move things around within these schools that we've applied for the waiver. So you jump down to an elementary three, now we're looking like a, a much more typical elementary school. About 600 students in this school, all six grade levels. You can see we're able to save a teacher in K and two, but not in the other four grade levels, because again, their, their staffing is so, so tight and so small. Look at their fourth grade numbers. They have three teachers with exactly 75 kids. If you pull a teacher out of there and they have two, that's, it's, it's just not doable, right? So that's not a place we can save at that particular school. Start to look at elementary four and five. These look more like the typical elementary school in Montgomery County. There's about eight, 800 and 850 students in these buildings. That's about our normal size. The first two were obviously quite a bit smaller because they were K2, 3, 5, and then that third one was a magnet school that only has about five or 600 kids in it, okay? So these are typical looking elementary schools in Montgomery County, and you can see we're able to save four positions in each building. One in first, second, fourth, and fifth, one in K, two in first, one in fourth. That number got past me before it went to the printer. That number should actually be 268. It's correct down here, but not up there. So my apologies on that. But you can see where we're saving in these particular <laughs> schools. The only one I'll call your attention to here is elementary four. And look what's going on in their fourth grade. Those numbers are starting to creep up there. 137 students with five teachers. That's gonna put about 27, 27 and a half. 27 in a couple classrooms, 28 in a couple classrooms, right? That's, good. That's, a, that's a full classroom in a high needs environment of fourth graders. Um, that being said, we do believe from the research out of public impact happening in Charlotte, Mecklenburg, and Opportunity Culture, that with the right, the right leads in that grade level and the right supports, that we can support that school and those students in meaningful ways and actually improve our outcomes. Um, and so there's five different scenarios that you can see going on. And elementary five is really your ideal scenario, in my opinion. As an elementary director, that's where I would start looking at my schools that look like that. 
you can see every one of these grade levels when you look at the K through the, the the actual teaching ratio versus the adult ratio, we're still barely over that BEP number at 20.8, even removing the teachers, and we're actually barely under it in fourth and fifth grade at the elementary level, removing that fourth grade teacher. And so we're still in really good shape in both those places. The, the teachers honestly aren't going to fill the class sizes there any more than they would in a typical year where they just happen to have a lot of fourth graders. And having done elementary staffing for four or five years now, I can tell you, you see this in pockets all over your district anyways. Sometimes it hits one school a little bit harder because there just happen to be not enough kids for that extra teacher there. And so it's happening in elementary five here, and they're still going to wind up with an additional, let's see, an additional eight ELTRs or uh, EMTRs running around their building next year helping support students. And so you can see our total for the elementary level, we saved 15 teaching positions, a little over a million dollars saved that would funnel right back into their education, um, and producing 30 residents. Now, the last disclaimer I'll give is obviously that's still representing our local portion of BEP dollars, right? I'm not saying that we're going to save a million BEP dollars because the BEP is not fully funded, right? But it's still, that that's, is still considering our local uh, portion of BEP dollars, which I still consider to not impact the GP budget because those were positions we were having to pay for anyways. They're, they're positions we were budgeting for anyways. So I do feel like that, that's an important disclaimer as well. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Imperich just to talk about middle school model, and then we'll jump back into supports here in a little bit, which is really where the rubber meets the road. Okay. I just want to um, go backwards for a second. So those 30 residents, when you saw the graphic, those would be 10 non-degree elementary out of the EMTR, the elementary middle uh, teacher residency, and they'd be the 20 Lipscomb, which is a K-5 special ed, K-5 certification with a master's. That's what that represents, okay, as far as our pipeline work goes. I also said the way we came up with these numbers is we rolled up our numbers, plus in those particular schools, the percentages of increase or decrease we've seen in the past couple of years. Okay, so we applied all that to get to our numbers. Okay, so middle school's different. Um, we have teams in middle school. Sometimes you just can't pull a teacher or it's, it's not advantageous to do that. So I'll lead you through the middle school. So this first middle school, you'll see that, you know, sixth grade is one of those when you have teams, you live with the number of teachers you have. That they go by a different class size ratio, average class size of 25, not to exceed 30. So we were able to pull three teachers out of that first middle school um, in sixth grade. Now, the adult ratio that you see in sixth grade, so it goes to 21.6, but the adult, adult ratio goes from, well, I'm sorry, the sixth grade ratio goes from 21.66 to 26. Um, and the adult ratio goes to 22.9. But the pathway we're talking about in the EMTR, those are math or science teachers with a dual certification in special ed. So you won't see that adult ratio like elementary go down across that grade level. You'll see it in math and science. Okay, so I want that disclaimer. Okay, the next middle school is a very small middle school for us. It's our smallest middle school. But we're able in the sixth grade to take one teacher and replace that with uh, two residents. And again, you'll see um, those of you that have staffed for middle schools, 12s are a good number for teams, 10s are a good number. This one's a nine and a half. Anytime you can get a four or five person team for your core is a, is a good number. Okay, so when we looked at staffing, we put best practice in middle school into this staffing. So middle school three, again, you can see we can take two out of sixth grade, um, and that ratio goes from 23.76 to 26.93. We can take two out of seventh grade. We can take two out of eighth grade, significantly impacting the school and the number of residents. This particular school has had NTR uh, uh, residents in the school and can't wait to do this with a three-year program because of the experience they had with Nashville teacher residents. Okay. Middle school four, 
you can see, again, we can take two out of sixth grade, and that's all I really wanted to touch when you look at those numbers. And then middle school five, two out of sixth grade, and that's all we wanted to touch. So we pulled 15, uh, utilized 15 teachers in middle school for a total of 30 residents for another million five. So here's the budget. So what we're committed to, and the reason we got this waiver is we said any money that we generate from reducing those, the teachers goes right back in to grow your own, every dollar. So obviously 60 residents is the biggest cost. At 26,000, you're talking about 1.56. The APSU tuition for the 10 elementary and the 30 middle school this is per year, over three years, is 137000 The Lipscomb tuition for the one year is 274820 for the 20. These, these candidates, although I know that David Donaldson is going to work on residency programs and praxis tests, I know he's going to work on that, but right now they have to take praxis tests. Someday in the near future they may not have to, <laughs> but right now they do. And so we, we, we pay for their praxis tests, and we pay for their practice support. And then when we talk about wraparound support for them at the college level, we've contracted with AVID, and I want to introduce Dr. Roz Evans from AVID. Raise your hand, Roz, in case anybody wants to speak to you. And so what AVID does is provide the college support. So if you have AVID in your elementary or high schools, what you know is they focus in four areas. That will, First of all, they focus with first generation, ethnically diverse students. And in a high school, they try to expose average students to above average classes <coughs> with tutoring support. And the areas they provide tutoring support is in focus note taking, critical reading, okay, and um, structured writing. So if you've ever been a first generation uh, college students, I know I was, where did I, where did I struggle? I took notes on everything, right? I highlighted everything and I did not know how to start a paper, right? The fourth area that they look at is inquiry-based tutoring support in areas that they have lab requirements in either reading, writing, or math in the acceptance in their college, okay? So they support in those areas. And I will tell you this, as we get to this, you can't invite first generation ethnically diverse students to college and not support them. That's criminal. Right now, our average scores in our US, we've taken two classes. The average scores in their US history are above the average of Austin P, but that's with a lot of support. We meet with them three days a week after school. Austin P helps support us with that, so it's with a lot of wraparound support. Okay, so let's talk about teacher residency supports, and I want to call up uh, Dr. Prentice Chandler to talk about the supports at Austin. Yeah, P. so this slide is basically this is the team that makes that makes this work. Uh, Dr. Lisa Barron, who's our director of teacher education and partnerships, did the lion's share of the background work on this, getting this thing up and going. Dr. Benita Brewster could probably speak to, to these bullet points better than me. Um, the big takeaway here is that it's a complete university effort. Uh, I know that you may not believe this, but it's hard to get other colleges to do stuff that you want them to do, uh, when, especially when they know that they don't have to. And so a lot of the work that Dr. Brewster has done is convincing department chairs and deans of other colleges to work with us and offer courses in the format that, that we need them. Uh, again, it probably is no surprise to you that uh, a lot of this has to go through financial aid, and so each, in each individual student's case is specific, and so financial aid is having to, having to learn new ways to do things and, and work with us. Um, advising is, is sort of common sense. Uh, finding adjuncts to help us with this. Uh, CMCSS has offered to help teach some of the courses, and then, of course, our faculty. This is just speaking to, uh, for, the, for the district leaders in the room, when you talk to a university about doing this, when you talk to a College of Ed Dean and their, and their team, make sure this is a, a focus of the conversation. 
because it's one thing for you to all figure out, as, as he has said, it's sort of criminal to send first generation people to school on an accelerated pathway and not give them help. Let this be a focus of what, of what you talk about. Because y'all can figure out the numbers and the tuition, and the College of Ed Dean can figure out how, to, how the courses are supposed to work. There's a whole lot of, and, and Dr. Barron's gonna talk about this later, there's quite a bit of work that goes into this way before the students show up for classes. And then from Clarksville, Montgomery County School System's point of view, before I get to that, I want to tell you our initial conversation in 2018. We were sitting around in a partnership meeting and we threw out, at that time, could we do with this with 30 classified? We weren't even thinking of our high school seniors yet. We thought that would be further down the road. And we said, hey, what we want to do is put them in classrooms as residents. They'll work during the day. They'll go to school at night. And the first comment is, well, that, that can't be done. I said, well, why can't that be get done? Because we don't do education night classes. And I said, well, if we get 30, could you do them? And Dr. Chandler said, absolutely, we could. So sometimes that's where you're starting. I, I want you to know that, OK? You're breaking some paradigms of the way we do things. But here's what I also have to say. With the residency model and the way that the state's going, if if all you're running is traditional education programs, you're going to become obsolete. Because there are outside EPPs that are not associated with a college or a university that will fill the gap. And they should. And we benefited through all three. We've, we benefited through a public partnership, a private partnership, and an outside EPP. And it's going to take that to, to really except the greatest challenge we've got in the state of Tennessee right now and in the nation, which is putting quality teachers that match the diversity of our students in classrooms. So from our perspective, there were numbers you didn't see in that budget. Okay, you saw the tuition numbers, you saw the practice support numbers, you saw the AVID support numbers. What you didn't see is what we pay our master teachers. What you didn't see are textbook costs, things like that. We believe that those should be funneled through our title budgets. So when I started overseeing title some 12 years ago, we were buying a lot of stuff. Okay, so every one of those schools that we looked at right now were title schools. That allows us to access some of our title money. So we were buying a lot of stuff then. You know, as time went on, we started trying to get a class size reduction in those key grade levels. But then it became hard to hire teachers. And class size reduction only works if you have quality teachers to help with the class size reduction. Then we started buying more academic coaches and supports so that we could put people in place to help train teachers up, <coughs> new teachers up, to, give, to, to close that gap and that variability between an outstanding five level teacher and a brand new teacher as soon as possible. We see this as the next level. Let schools be able to support and districts be able to support grow your own. And in doing so, we'll provide some of those supports through some master teachers. Doesn't mean we still don't look at academic coaches, but we're looking at this money differently. So we redirected uh, our director of federal projects position. We took Dr. Casebolt and we hired her out of HR, which was our human uh, director of, of uh, educator quality and put her in this position so she can help guide the Grow Your Own work. She has an HR mindset. She was a high school principal. Make sure we have fidelity to this process and redirect federal funds to where we need them most. This is about allocation of resources and aligning your resources to your most needed areas. So I talked to you about AVID. Again, over 30 years of success with first generation ethnically diverse students we wanted to partner with AVID. We didn't want to recreate the wheel. If you're interested in knowing more about AVID, Roz Evans is here. Clarksville Montgomery County Education Association. So Constance Brown is here. She's the head of our association in the district. And two years ago, she made an appointment to talk to me in my office. And she said, what are you doing about the teacher shortage? And so we had the initial plans of these pipelines, including the start with NTR, what we wanted to do for non-degreed. We went through it and I said, this is what we're trying to do to stay ahead of this constants. I get it, we've got to support teachers. By the way, what are you guys doing? And she kind of looked at me with big eyes. And I said, this is the challenge 
that districts are facing throughout the nation. Wouldn't it be great if a district and an association worked together on this? And she has done more than that. So when I presented this, Phyllis, uh, Dr. Casebold and I presented this to her board about whether they wanted to be partners, our first idea is give us some textbook money. I don't know about you, but if you bought our textbooks going through this program, I'd probably want to join your association. I'm not here to promote that. We won't do a hard sell, but it shows a commitment to future teachers. Well, when I presented that to them, they overwhelmingly voted in support for it. And then they said, we don't want to just pay for their textbooks. We want to help them be successful. So our AVID tutors are the association. So the after school support is the association. Um, CMTSS is adjunct professors just trying to get the cost reasonable. We said, hey, look, we've got people with masters and doctorates throughout this district. We'll help teach your education courses. Don't charge us an adjunct fee. This is part of what we do. We, get, we can help go to, from theory to practice. If you want us to teach all of them, great. If we want to teach some of them, we'll have fidelity to, to your syllabus. But we can make theory come to practice real easy. That's what we do every day. So that was part of the agreement. And then Dr. Bellamy is going to talk to you about the in on the job support, the multi-classroom leaders. So um, just fair warning, I, I, this, this is exciting work. This is what I was telling you about. I started my work on a couple of years ago. Um, I'd asked permission from Mr. House, from Dr. Imperatrice, to start talking to some of our teachers that have left our high needs environments, our very successful teachers of these high, of high needs environments and asked them why they left. I talked to some that stayed and asked them why they stayed and um, got some very intriguing answers. And that, that set me on a path to find, again, the, the work from public impact and the opportunity culture. Went to a visit in Charlotte Mecklenburg to look where they've been doing this for years and, and really look at what they're doing. So when we talk about their on-the-job support, what we're really trying to do here is we're trying to create successful teacher <laughs> residents down the road. People that are prepared to, on day one to go into a classroom and teach students that I personally was not prepared to teach on my day one. We're supporting those people with uh, multi-class leaders. I'll talk a little bit about that role. Today's not about the ins and outs of opportunity culture, um, but if, if you want to talk to me about it, please reach out. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about what we're doing uh, for as long as you want. I could stay up here for, for hours and talk to you about it. And at the end of the day, the most important part, what I set out to do in the beginning was improve outcomes for my neediest students. I had five or six elementary schools that I could not staff with the teachers I needed. I couldn't staff with the principals I needed. When it really came to a head for me is when I had one school open that every principal in my district applied to transfer to, and I had a needy school open and not a single one applied. And that's what really is the elementary director just kind of stuck right here, and I knew that there was something I had to do different, or I'm never gonna break that cycle. And so we talk a lot about increasing achievement and improving student achievement, but student achievement's a symptom of other big problems. It's not the root cause of those problems. It's just my opinion. And equity gap's not something you're gonna Google. This is a term that I throw around in Montgomery County, and I'm, I'm stuck with it now. I like it, and so you, you have to change my mind that I need to call it something different if you want. But I use it to talk about those staffing issues that I had, right? There's this cycle going on constantly where my best teachers are opting out of my highest need environment and my highest need schools are hiring brand new teachers right out of college that are not equipped to teach the kids in front of them. And that's not their fault, that's not the college's fault, um, and it's, it's not the principal's fault even. It's a hard job to walk into right out of college, right? And so at the end of the day, my neediest students are much less likely to have access to effective teachers. And if anybody wants to convince me otherwise, we can stay as long as you want tonight and you can try. But that's just what I've seen play out in four years of being the elementary director. I can tell you that my neediest students are far less likely to have access to consistently effective teachers throughout their, their academic career. And so we set out to solve some problems like that. And so how are we gonna do it? What do the on-the-job supports look like for these teacher residents so that we're doing the things I promised you we could do? And that first person right there in the middle is what we call an MCL. That's a multi-class leader. This is someone who teaches about 40% of the day and the rest of their day, they invest in those team teachers and those TRs, those teacher residents. So the rest of the day, they work in contact with a team of three to four teachers they're working with daily to coach. Now imagine your first year in the classroom, if you had a five-level teacher that came into your room for an hour a day. 
not one hour in August and then came back in October to ask how the recommendations went, but an hour every single day. And then because you have teacher residents that are getting real on-the-job experience teaching students and working with all these team teachers, there's also time in the day that you can meet and talk about what I just saw. They're getting real on-the-job coaching every single day. So take those team teachers now who are typically first, second, third year teachers that we lose at what rate do we lose new teachers in this in this profession? 50% by the third year, right? Residencies stay at about the, the rate of 94%. Um, so the, the attrition rate's far greater in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a general education student of the traditional manner, right? And so those are the teachers we're usually losing at a rate of 50% every three years. Now imagine the rate we can keep them when they get the on-the-job on support that we know they need, right? And imagine what their performance does over time when I get back to that improving outcome for students. Now ask yourself, if you were a teacher in that environment, would you rather have one or two extra kids in your class with on-the-job support every single day? Or do you just want two less kids in your class and shut your door and be left alone? What model is going to work for you? What model is currently failing us? And what model do we might need to try? Right? So those are the questions we set out to really talk through. And then at the end of the day, you have our teacher residents here. And I said, what are their on-the-job supports so that they can make a residency work? And so, A, they've got the best of the best. Our MCLs are not five-level teachers. They're five-level teachers over an extended period of time. These are the fives of the fives. They're not just the top 20%. They're the top 20% of the top 20%. So we went out and tried to find and recruit our absolute best teachers into our highest needs environment. When we did this last spring, out of the 15 MCL positions we posted, nine of them came out of schools into high needs environments. Six of them were already in that high needs environment incentivized to stay. There is a structure that they get paid more, they get that release time. We can talk about the ins and outs of that if we ever need to, but today's not about that. But there are incentives for those things for them. So those TRs are immediately connected to a multi-class leader for three years. The best teacher we can find, three straight years. They're also supported by those team teachers as they're learning on the job. Um, and they're also earning a living wage, earning a free degree the whole time they're doing that, right? But that's the model that really makes it tick. Um, and it's about that word opportunity. So it's, when you look at, our, at, a, at a typical structure right now, if you're getting hired into our district, you can be a teacher, or you might see yourself advancing to an administrator. There's some instructional coach roles, kind of a dotted line to the side, right? Under an opportunity culture model, you can start as a teacher resident, you could be on a teacher, you could just be a general teacher, have gone through your residency, maybe land somewhere in the district that doesn't have this structure and still be a teacher. You could be a team teacher and teach in this model. You can be a multi-class leader and see that as anybody working on teacher leadership roles, keeping our best teachers in the classroom. A lot of research on that recently. How do we keep our best teachers in the classroom? Research is showing that's how. We incentivize them to do that and give them leadership roles that make them, that make them feel uh, needed, meaningful in, in their work. And then ultimately, you can still advance to an administrator if you want. Um, side note, the people I interviewed in, in Charlotte-Mecklenburg, those MCLs, most of them said they would never consider leaving the classroom now that they have the MCL role. They looked me in the eye and said, I have the best job in the district. Why would I leave? And so that's, that's the heart of teacher leadership. That's what we want these people doing, right? And what kind, of, what kind of model is that setting for all these people working for them? So we're setting opportunities for teachers and opportunities for those residents. And at the end of the day, what if I told you the research shows that you can add students to classrooms, get your union to be on board with that, and improve student achievement? Um, and we don't have the re we haven't been doing it long enough to tell you how it's working in Montgomery County right now, but Public Impact has looked at the results from Charlotte Mecklenburg. And they're very promising. So you can see teacher effect sizes jumping up when they work on these teams. And those of you researchers in the room know that the teacher effect size of that jump, you know what that does to student achievement, right? Which again, student achievement is, is a symptom of bigger problems we're trying to fix here. Those staffing issues, the access to consistently effective teachers. The person in front of that room matters more than anybody. So ultimately, at the end of the day, we're changing opportunities for, for our students as well. And so they're going to talk about the timeline of how we pulled all this off in a little bit. I know I've thrown a lot at you about opportunity culture and that residency support, and I'm sure I haven't answered all the questions you have. So I'm available after this or through email or anything I can do to help that. Um, I'd really love to. I'm, I'm a champion for, for thinking outside the box and for this model in particular. And watching it take off since August of this year 
and see stories of how it's changing teachers. Last personal story I'll tell you. We have a teacher that was this close to being non-renewed last year. Honestly, the reason she wasn't is because we couldn't replace her. There's not somebody in the pool to replace. Five years ago, she would have been non-renewed. Um, they gave her an extra uh, one more chance. Her first observation after working with her MCL every day for the first two months of the school year, all fours and fives. And that came from my best principal in the district who actually just became the elementary director after I vacated that role. Not an easy person to get fours or fives with. But that MCL has changed that teacher's life. She's changed her, her trajectory of her career. And ultimately, think about all the students that, that person's going to teach for the next 30 years of their career. That's a person we would have lost. That's now a, a four or five level teacher inside of two months in that dynamic role. Um, and so at, at the end of the day, we're increasing diversity. We're hopefully increasing student achievement. We're producing residents that are better equipped to teach our kids, creating leadership opportunities for teachers, and all doing this with a net cost of zero extra dollars to our GP budget. If, if I can't sell you on being interested after that, then I probably can't sell you. So I'm gonna turn it over and let them talk about the timeline a little bit more. And again, I'd love to talk to anybody else that wants to know more about that particular model. Okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about the timeline. I'm the Director of Teacher Education and Partnerships at Austin P. And um, a lot of what we started in 2017 is built on the foundation that Susan Jones and Michael Durline and their team created for us, the structure that they created in working with our partnerships. Um, you see all this work, and it's kind of like Dr. Chandler was talking about Big P and Little P. You see this work, and you think, man, that's awesome. But I'm telling you, this level of partnership work wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had the foundation that was established in, starting in August of 2017. Uh, Dr. Chandler became dean about that time. I was the director of teacher education and partnerships. Um, we had new leadership in the district. Uh, a lot of things were happening that caused our conversations to be different. And um, one of the first things we had to do in developing these uh, partnership relationships that led to this level of work, and it's something that I would encourage you to think about as EPPs, as you are LEAs, as you're working with each other, is how do you get to this level of partnership before you jump into this type of work? Um, and some of the things we did, and not only with Clarkson, Montgomery County, but also with our other districts, the Cheatham, uh, Robertson, Dixon, uh, Sumner, Stewart, or our partners, is that we had to re redefine our relationship. What does our relationship really consist of? What is important? And how do we get at common goals? And how do we work together? We were. Um, Dr. Chandler says all the time we were on the same team, and we didn't know it because we were working toward the same goals, but we were working in silos. We weren't working together. And so a lot of it had to come, this seems very simplistic, but we had to just start talking to each other. And um, that didn't always happen before. And we had to say, these are our, our strategic, uh, this is our strategic plan. Um, and then we had to listen to our districts and what did they value in the work and then develop a, an honest conversation. We did a SWOT analysis, which again seems kind of simplistic, right? But it was that type of just nitty gritty work that focused all of us on what we needed and that became kind of like a punch list of, of our work <laughs> going forward. Um, and so we've been able to come back to them and say, this, you, did, you identified that this is a need, this is how we are approaching that need. And then, um, again, overcoming challenges, um, being creative, thinking outside the box. Uh, just because something has always been done the same way, we had to be innovative in the way that we were approaching our partnership and our relationships. So this timeline, and I know it's, it's super tiny font, so you really can't read it at all, probably. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I hope it kind of paints the picture of all the things that went on before really uh, 2018, 2019 uh, in, in this school year, a lot of the really hard conversations and building that relationship and that trust happened starting in 2017. So 2017, 2018 led to this. Um, and I think that's really important to emphasize that there has to be, it'd be kind of like entering into an arranged marriage. 
uh, if you did this type of partnership work with someone you didn't know, as opposed to going through the dating and engagement and all of that, that we've kind of done. So um, uh, it's been a thrill for us to, to work with, and it's certainly been a highlight of the work that we do at Austin P. So uh, Dr. Barron's right. Um, in 2017, we restarted our relationship, um, and it was with a new set of eyes and values. And one of the first things that Austin P did was show us their report card. So I don't know how many of your districts know that you, your EPP colleges are getting report cards, and they're getting them on how those teachers are performing after they leave their school as far as value added in a number of areas. But the area they needed the most help with was increasing their diversity. The area we had been working on for three years was increasing diversity. So it was easy to start having a partnership focus around increasing diversity because it served the college as well as it served the school district. And quite frankly, the university, a, 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 a district that serves a university, they're the only ones that are going to really help them increase diversity in their teacher ed program, right? So, and a university in town, if we feed candidates to them that are more diverse, they're going to be more diverse. I don't know about you, but we've been recruiting, you know, outside our state for years. We hire 400 a year, teachers a year, based on our growth and our mobility in our first years and 89.5% or 89% retention rate, but by, by the end of the third year, we're down to that 50%. So we go to historically black colleges and universities, um, historically Hispanic universities, but you're competing against everybody else. So if you want your community to match your students, uh, or your teachers to match your students, you've got to invest in your community. That's where the data is, okay? So that's where we were able to come together through some of these partnership meetings. Now, if, if you take on this challenge this coming year, you know, if you get yourself a partner and you come back to the December meeting, which will be a lot more of planning, a lot more of this document, this is what you've got to face from that January to August. Here are all the things we had to do in order to get, you know, to get kids accepted to the university, to get classifieds accepted to the university, to interview our best candidates, to make sure that the classified took the AccuPlacer test, uh, to make sure that uh, the schools that they were going to had a chance to interview and select the candidates, to ensure that we had the AVID supports in place, to ensure financial aid, um, textbooks, uh, classrooms, all of that were ad allocated for an August opening, okay? So it's pretty intense. So one of the things I'm gonna tell you is, in this current waiver, we asked for a waiver for two schools this year, not for next year. And the reason we did that is we contracted this work out, but we all participated in it. So we asked for two positions uh, that we will go above average this year and we have posted two educator pipeline facilitators that will help us with the logistical work, the parent meetings, the, the uh, classified meetings, the informational meetings, the recruitment, the interviewing, the being a um, liaison to the college admissions and acceptance. Uh, we were committed that we were looking for diversity, first generation, first and foremost. We had four candidates that the principals had told us worked real well with students um, that could not meet, at that point, the AccuPlacer scores necessary to be admitted into college at APSU. And basically what we said is we're a school district. We got people with masters and doctorates in ELA and math, and that's what this pretty much focuses on. We saw this as an exposure issue. If we can't bring people together and in a month work with them three days a week and get them to pass it, who can? Right? And sure enough, those four ladies made admission requirements. We gave them conditional acceptance 
And we bypassed other people that met the requirements because of the re recommendations of their principals and their work with kids. There were longstanding employees that were ethnically diverse that needed an opportunity. And so you have to make those processes and create those processes with your university. It can be done, but it's going to be very hard to be done in an arranged marriage. If you have that type of situation where you can openly talk to each other. Dr. Brewster, I always tell her she's my favorite person because she is committed to making this work. She's every one of their advisors. But you know what? Even with the intention of making it work, there are hiccups along the way because it's the first time you do it. And you have to presume positive intent from both parties or you'll get into a rut of saying, what are they thinking? Don't they know this should already be done? Well, no, they don't because it's, we've never done it before. <laughs> and same with us. So, Dr. Chandler? I was just, you're going to hear that it can't be done a lot if you decide to do this. That's one of the constant refrains, or we can't do it that way, or that doesn't work that way, or we don't do it that way. You just have to find a way to make it work. You That's just all. make it work. Yeah. You got to have a commitment for both parties. So. Okay, so now let's talk about the why. This is in your packet. So, so our district did get a press release announcing that there was a waiver, but it has not been announced till today that it's a class size waiver. So that's being announced, and I'm meeting with Constance Brown and the association tomorrow, and uh, another group that we have. I've got both those leaders on board. They understand the why, but it's very important that your teachers understand the why here, because if they don't, they're going to just say, hey, you're just putting more people in our classes. Here's another thing I want to show you. When we pulled out the 15 teachers in elementary and middle school, remember, if you're going for a non-degree pipeline, we didn't pull out everybody we could have pulled out in title schools because we have the one year of the three year, the ELTR, funded in GP and some in title. This one will be funded with the waiver. We've got one more year to go to make sure those high school seniors have an opportunity, right? So three years, it's a three-year pipeline. I'll tell you this about high school seniors too, just so you know. The way we were able to get some costs down is you take those that have been admitted with the HOPE scholarship. You get a big financial aid break from that. So they have to keep their HOPE in order to do this. But let's talk about the why. Utilizing the existing money to expand teacher pipeline, um, and it does not impact GP. The expansion does not impact GP. The first one did. Decreases adult to student ratio. Provides leadership opportunities for teachers, multi-classroom leaders. Brings local students and classified personnel into the teaching profession. You're investing in your community. Closes the diversity rate of teachers compared to the students they serve. You heard Mason talk about that. We're more close to 35, 40% as opposed to 16%. And our NTR pipeline is right at 50%. Um, reinforces CMCSS as an innovative district committed to supporting the growth and development of teachers. If you're in those top five districts as far as pop student population go, your, your teacher shortage is compounding every year. And if you don't have a proactive solution to it, then all it's going to do is continue to compound. Um, reduces the number of new teachers CMCS needs to hire in 2021. We didn't talk a lot about that, but there's 30 less teachers we have to hire next year because we pulled out of that ratio. District and association collaboration to solve teacher shortage. CMCEA supports wraparound support and purchases some textbooks for the residents. Residencies, and you heard uh, Dr. Bellamy talk about this, have a 93% retention rate after three years as opposed to traditional student teaching that has a 50%. We were 30 teachers short in 18 and 19, would have been 80 short in 19, 20. Grow your own initiative, support putting quality teachers in every classroom. I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Josh Mason. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Josh Mason. I'm the Senior Director of Leadership for the department. And one of my privileges uh, is to get to lead the Grow Your Own work. So I hope 
that my phone starts ringing off the hook and I start hearing from you on a regular basis. When you signed up to come here today, I assume you were wondering if you could do a Grow Your Own initiative. Now, I hope you're wondering how. So we're going to help you with that. A lot of the talk today was around the waiver. I hope that was exciting to you because when we think about Grow Your Own, money always seems to be the obstacle. But when we think about innovative ways to use the class size waiver and some title funds, there are ways to do this without dramatically impacting your budget. So if you're interested in a waiver, here's some information that we're going to be asking for as you submit those requests. One, we want to know that you're not going to exceed the class size maximums. So there's no waiver for that. We want to know why are you doing this? What problem are you trying to address? Remember Clarksville was trying to first address a diversity problem, then a teacher shortage problem, and then a problem with high need certifications. They've managed to do that, all, I'll do all three through their program, but really be clear about what are you trying to do? Then who's gonna participate? You heard Clarksville talk about non-degreed uh, teaching assistants, degreed teaching assistants, and high school seniors. <coughs> Be clear about how you're going to use the money you save if you're awarded a class size waiver to directly then support Grow Your Own initiatives. Also, you heard Austin P talk a lot about um, having to work within their institution to offer classes that made sense. In order to do this, these people need to work a full-time job. They need to be teacher assistants. That means that their classes probably aren't going to start until well into the evening. And we also have to think about the fact that their day will start early. So you're going to have to think with your partner around how can you make this coursework work. Austin P will be a good resource later to talk about that. Also, what partnerships? Think of all the partnerships you heard today just to make this get off the ground. Not just Austin P. You've got Lipscomb, you've got National Teacher Residency, you've got the partnership with AVID, you've got the partnership with the Teachers Association. You've got partnerships all over the place to make this work. And also, we'll want to know, how are you going to support residents professionally to become the effective teachers you want them to be? And also, how are you going to address those academic supports that you heard over and over today that are so critical? Remember who you're selecting. You're selecting oftentimes people who opted not to go to school. It's probably been a long time since they were in school. They're going to need some help. I know when I went back to school later in my life, it was very difficult for me to get back into a school mindset and also balance that with work. We're going to have to help folks with that. If we really care about them and we want to help them through the program, we have to think through those things with them. Here are the things that are most important to us as we review uh, class size waivers uh, for the commissioner's approval. Dual certification is a must. So either a grade level or a content area with special education or ESL. Why are those important? Because when we talk to you, you tell us those are the things you need the most. We have to have special education teachers and we have to have ESL certified teachers. And we need a paid internship pathway. You heard about the multi-year residency to earn the bachelor's degree and a license. And in some cases, you have the one-year residency option to earn a master's degree and licensure. We also want these people to be in classrooms with the most effective teachers. You heard uh, Dr. Bellamy talk about these people are in the level five of all level five teachers' classrooms. We want them learning the habits of our best teachers. And we want to make sure, again, that they have the supports they need to be successful in this program. <coughs> I hope by now you're wondering, what do I do now? I'm ready to do this. Let's make this happen. What do I do? Well, one, you really got to take a look around and determine your district readiness. Here in a little bit, we'll break out, and you'll have a chance to ask questions. Sean Imperatrice would be a good person to ask questions about um, how he determined his district was ready. Uh, but you've got to think about your internal capacity to handle this. And he can talk to you about some staffing they, they, did, they did in order to uh, make this work. 
Think about who's going to be benefit from this. Are you going to target degreed EAs? Maybe you don't have a lot of those. Are you going to target non-degreed EAs? Well, then how do we develop a plan for them? Think about the future. We know the baby boomers are the largest generation, uh, and they're going to start retiring at dramatic rates. Maybe not next year, but remember, if you start a three-year residency, you have graduates three years from now. Are there vacancies you can predict three years out? Do you have the financial flexibility to pull this off? That's a conversation you've got to have and, and think about. And with stakeholder engagement, is this something your board would be excited about? Are there, um, is your teacher's union going to be supportive of this? Are your teachers are going to be supportive of a few extra students in their class? So those are some things to think about on the front end, and I would say equally important, equally as important, identify who those partners could be. Who can work with you to get degrees in the hands of people who do not have degrees? We are excited to announce we're going to have a follow-up meeting to this. You guys have heard from us quite a bit. But what we haven't done is talk with our university partners a lot. We are going to send out to all uh, ed prep programs in Tennessee. We're going to send an invite. Uh, Clarksville Montgomery County has been kind enough to host us. Uh, we're going to send out a, a, an invite to them, and we're going to encourage them to talk to you and meet there. We're hoping this is going to be kind of a workshop type environment where we can really start thinking and planning grow your own initiatives. If there's a partner, that you really would like to work with or you would like to consider this, please let them know. They will be getting uh, an email this week from us letting them know about this meeting, but encourage them to come. If this is something you're truly interested in doing, encourage them to come. <coughs> All of our contact information is here, so if you've got the handouts, you have our uh, contact information. Please know I am happy to help in any way that I possibly can, but I hope that as we wrap up today, you have a lot of questions. So we're gonna do Q&A a little bit differently